Hydration is a misunderstood topic in the health and fitness space. In fact, the common recommendation of drinking 8 glasses of water per day may just be based on either an offhand comment made by a nutritionist several decades ago or based on the obituary of that very same nutritionist. So not even any actual evidence. So how much water should you be drinking for health and to build muscle? Is there a simple guideline you can follow? Is it even something that you need to worry about? Welcome back, Dr. Milo Wolf here today with you, PhD in sports science with Wolf Coaching, talking about hydration. Before we head into this video, I want to give a quick primer on taxonomy. Being dehydrated actually isn't the right term when it comes to being insufficiently hydrated. Dehydration is the process of going from normally hydrated or you hydrated to becoming hypohydrated. So throughout this video, I'll be referring to things as euhydration, when you have sufficient hydration, and hypohydration. First off, when it comes to hypohydration and its effects on lifting, not being sufficiently hydrated is a bad thing when it comes to performance in the gym. This is well established across a variety of sports, but it is also well established when it comes to lifting specifically. Let me give you an example study in 2007 by Judalston and colleagues. In this study, they took participants and had them perform a training session composed of six sets of squats at 80% of their max in three different conditions. In two of the conditions, they performed incline walking on a treadmill in a highly humid and heated room as a means to lose body water until they reach hypohydration statuses of having lost either 2.5% of their body weight or 5% of their body weight. The nerd in me there considered saying body mass because that's technically the scientifically accurate term, but then I reconsidered because I'm no nerd. You feel me? Check out the neck. That ain't no pencil neck, you hear me? In the third condition, they also performed this incline walking to minimize any confounding effect of the exercise, but they also rehydrated so that they wouldn't suffer any hypohydration. Just as intended, walking on a treadmill in a humid, heated room did result in hypohydration when they were trying to do so. And then they wanted to see how that hypohydration would impact their subsequent squat performance within that session. And guess what? It turns out that being hypohydrated it's not good for performance. When they'd lost either two and a half or 5% of their body mass through dehydration, they performed worse. And as you'd expect, they performed worse with 5% versus two and a half percent. And well, worse performance within the gym probably isn't a good thing when it comes to stimulating muscle growth long-term. Interestingly though, the authors also looked at jumping performance and they saw that dehydration didn't really negatively impact jumping performance. In fact, almost the opposite. And as it turns out, that is also the case in a variety of studies within the broader literature. Indeed, in some studies, dehydration can actually enhance performance of body weight dependent tasks, like jumping and even marathon running, where simply by being a bit lighter, that can increase your performance because you're talking about losing a substantial proportion of your body weight. And so even though dehydration and being hypohydrated isn't ideal for performance when it comes to body weight dependent tasks, it may not be such a big deal. And in fact, the reduction in your performance, strictly speaking, might be offset by the reduction in your body weight, creating overall a positive effect on your performance. But that is only in body weight dependent situations. And equally, that is largely outside of the scope of this video. We're talking about overall health here and specifically muscle building and strength gains within the gym. I mentioned the study by Judd Olson and colleagues from 2007 as an example, but there is a more recent meta-analysis on the topic of 28 studies looking at the effects of being hypohydrated on performance in terms of muscle strength and in terms of strength endurance, or essentially doing sets of multiple repetitions or similar tasks. Across these 28 studies, hypohydration led to a reduction in muscle endurance of on average 8.3%. Importantly, there were a few things to note. One, that reduction in performance was similar for upper and lower body performance. Two, that reduction in performance was a little bit attenuated when it came to trained participants as opposed to untrained participants. And three, that reduction in performance was substantially smaller when it came to creating dehydration through passive versus active means. And this is an important distinction because passive dehydration, for example, involves simply restricting your fluid intake, whereas active dehydration, as was used in some of these studies, involves exercising to lose fluids. And at that point, it becomes difficult to tell, did your performance take a hit simply because you were hypohydrated 
or did it also take a hit because you exercised and exercise causes fatigue? The same results were also found when it came to muscle strength with a reduction in performance of 5.5% when hypohydrated compared to hydrated. And in general, some research does suggest that even mild hypohydration is not going to lead to good things, leading to, for example, higher pain perception or higher discomfort perception during exercise. And well, that begs an important question, and that is how common is hypohydration? Is it something that you need to be worried about? The bad news is it is likely relatively common. It's difficult to get a precise estimate on this, but based on a study in soccer players or football players, depending on where you live in the world, around 35 to 80% of soccer players suffer from mild hypohydration before going into soccer practice. As I mentioned earlier, this may or may not be desirable when it comes to body weight dependent tasks like soccer, but for us lifters, it is not desirable. And so if the prevalence of even just mild hypohydration is that high in athletes, presumably it may be something that you want to worry about as well. And then that begs the next question, which is how much should you be drinking? The issue with that is it depends. And it's certainly not eight glasses per day for everyone, as it turns out. And that's where a paper by Yamada and colleagues comes in that is actually quite helpful. They use data from a database of doubly labeled water trials to figure out how much different people should drink and what sort of factors impact optimal hydration or water intake. Using doubly labeled water and a dilution principle, they were able to establish mean water turnover, or essentially how much water goes into your body and out of your body which can then tell us how much water you need to consume in order to remain hydrated across different populations and in different environments. And based on this research, it turns out there's a few determinants of how much water you should be consuming in order to stay hydrated. Some of the bigger ones are climate, your body size, and specifically your fat-free mass, and finally, your physical activity levels. Here's a few broad takeaways or generalizations we can draw from the research. One, the higher the altitude you live at, the more water you need to drink to remain hydrated. Two, the warmer the climate you live in, both in terms of temperature and in terms of humidity, the more water you'll need to consume to remain hydrated. Three, the larger you are, specifically in terms of fat-free mass and not body fat, the more water you need to consume. Four, the more physically active you are, the more water you need to consume. And this also explains, by the way, in large part, why men typically need to consume more water than women. It's likely mostly because they are simply heavier and have more fat-free mass. Importantly, this relationship between temperature and how much water you should consume goes for anything above 10 degrees, whereas between about 10 and zero degrees, it's pretty similar. Below zero degrees Celsius, you would also need to consume a little bit more water. As an example of the effect of climate on water intake recommendations, in the summer versus in the spring, on average, you may want to consume about 0.7 liters more water. Now you might be saying, all those factors are cool, but I wanna know how much I should drink. Well, fortunately, they give a formula that you can use to derive roughly how much water you should be consuming based on your circumstances, or at least the circumstances that are likely to impact your water intake needs. Unfortunately, this formula is pretty complicated. So I'm gonna give you some broad generalizations that you can use that are gonna be a lot more accurate than just drinking eight glasses of water per day. A general guideline one and big caveat to what I'm about to say. Water intake can also occur from food. When you consume food, especially whole foods, those will contain a good amount of water. So whenever I give you a figure, just keep that in mind. Most individuals within most circumstances will be you hydrated with about three to four liters of water intake per day. In general, to help with this, consider having some fluids, maybe a glass or two, when you wake up. Once you've incorporated this broad recommendation of three to four liters a day, monitor thirst perception. If you're thirsty, drink more. And specifically, in certain conditions where you're more prone to hypohydration, for example, when you're exercising, when you're at altitude, when you're in hotter environments, or in particularly cold environments, in those situations, try and drink a little bit past your thirst. Likewise, when it comes to training in the gym, you will likely be better off by drinking a little bit more before a session, a little bit more during the session, and a little bit more after the session to be on the safe side. Ideally, you would be drinking enough to maintain your body weight during your session roughly. Then again, I don't really expect you to go ahead and weigh yourself during your session to make sure you're the exact same weight than as when you started. That would be a bit ridiculous. On a more long-term level, your urine color can be a pretty good predictor of your overall hydration status. If your urine is consistently darker than about light yellow but mostly transparent, 
it's a sign that you may want to drink more. If it's anything past dark yellow, definitely drink more. So we discussed that altitude, high temperatures, even low temperatures, being larger, being more physically active, all of those things can impact your hydration status. Is there anything else that predisposes you to being hypohydrated? Well, one claim you may have heard is that coffee dehydrates you. Turns out that isn't true. Based on a recent paper looking at the beverage hydration index of different beverages, coffee has a hydration index of pretty close to one, making it about as good for hydrating your body as water itself. For context, a beverage hydration index of one is how hydrating water is. So in fact, coffee isn't dehydrating you, it is hydrating you, and just about as well as water does. And importantly, that makes sense because coffee is mostly just water. Yeah, you added some caffeine, some antioxidants, some polyphenols, maybe even some fiber, and generally coffee is good for your health, as I've made a video about before, but it is mostly still just water. So it makes sense that it's hydrating you. Besides coffee and water being hydrating, other beverages that were particularly good at hydrating you were, unsurprisingly, oral sports solutions, orange juice, and generally just milk. But ultimately, most of the beverages being tested did about as good of a job as water, or sometimes even better. So outside of circumstances that very much predispose you to being hypohydrated, like running a marathon at altitude or in high heat, or doing a CrossFit workout with high volumes if you're jacked, outside of those circumstances, you probably don't need to worry much about your beverage choice. As long as you're having some fluid, diet soda will do, water will do, coffee will do, a wide variety of things will do, provided you're overall on top of your hydration game. Hydration 101. I broke down all of the science on what to drink, how much to drink, how it impacts your performance, whether you need to worry about it or not. Full disclosure, when I first got into this video, I thought this was going to be a why hydration is overrated and your body is good enough telling you when to drink. Turns out that wasn't the case. Doing some research illuminated me. If you enjoyed the video, please consider commenting, liking, subscribing, losing your shit over this sweater yet again. The sweater, it's pretty cool. I agree. It apparently looks cool on camera for some reason. I, I don't get it. I have a PhD in sports science, not in optical illusions. But at any rate, I know half of you aren't currently subscribed. So I'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe, even hit the bell, because I know many of you haven't done that as well. Bars. If there's any other videos you want to see me make, about any topics whatsoever, leave a comment down below and I'll get to it. If you'd like me to coach you, consider checking out the link above and I could be your coach. In the meantime, have a phenomenal day and I will see you guys, my subscribers, in that next one. Peace.